Coming up on DTNS, Dell's attempt at a responsible and repairable laptops. LG has a TV you can roll around your house and why you shouldn't look at the HDMI 2.1 label on a display and what you should look at instead. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, December 14th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. There is more where this came from, folks. If you like hearing us talk about stuff, get Good Day Internet, available at patreon.com slash DTNS. Big thanks to our top patrons. Today they include Andrew Bradley, Dale McCahey, and Scott Hepburn. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. U.S. CISA Director Jen Easterly said that the Log4j vulnerability is one of the most serious she has seen in her career. CISA believes hundreds of millions of devices are likely to be affected. CISA is creating a dedicated website to collect information companies need to protect themselves. There are multiple ways to exploit, but meeting one layer protection does not seem to be enough. CISA doesn't believe a single action can fix the issue and recommended organizations staff security teams over the holidays. Attempted attacks have risen to more than 800,000 per day as of Monday, according to Checkpoint. Yeah, uh, it's a race. It's a race, and it's a bad one. Microsoft is partnering with iFixit to sell official Microsoft service tools for Surface devices through iFixit.com. Take that, Apple. The tools include those for precision debonding and rebonding for adhesives, as well as some weights and accessories. They are not available to the general populace, though. You will need to be an iFixit Pro independent repairer or a Microsoft authorized service provider, Microsoft Experience Center, or Microsoft commercial customer in order to buy them. Log Me In plans to separate LastPass into a standalone company. That's six years after Log Me In acquired LastPass, uh, the password management tool, now used by more than 85,000 companies and 30 million users. This move is meant to accelerate the speed at which password management and secure sign-in tools can be developed. LastPass hints at improving the mobile app, adding more third-party tie-ins for corporate customers, a website redesign, and more support channels. Uh, you know, it occurs to me on a totally unrelated note, sometimes you uh, make a standalone company in order to prepare it for sale. That's just, you know, sometimes a random you do do that. unrelated yeah. thing to the thing you just said. 9 to 5 Google uh, noticed the Google job postings referencing an augmented reality OS and an innovative AR device. Former Oculus GM for operating systems Mark Lukowski is now a Google employee, posting on LinkedIn that he's now leading the operating system team for augmented reality at Google. The new team is based in the U.S. and Waterloo, Canada, which is actually home of North's Locals team, which was acquired by Google last year. In perhaps bad news for autonomous car fans, China's Pony AI has paused its driverless testing in California. A Pony AI car collided with a lane divider and a street sign in Fremont, California on October 28th. And after an investigation, the California DMV suspended Pony AI's driverless testing permit. It may still conduct tests with safety drivers on board. In better news, Honda Research Institute USA is conducting a pilot test with the Ohio Department of Transportation of a system to monitor lane markers and identify where they've faded and are in need of repair or restoration. The data will be made available to highway and transportation departments. Rob, if you could keep an eye out and tell us if you see fewer faded lane markings as a result of this. You know. We would appreciate that. Will do, will do. <laughs> All right, let's talk a little more about what Oppo's got going on. Inno Day is almost over, but they still have a few more announcements. Yeah, so Oppo announced its first in-house chip design, a neural processing unit, or MPU, for machine learning image performance called Mari Silicon X. It will show up in Oppo's next flagship in Q1 and be manufactured by TSMC. Air Glass is an AR device launching early next year in limited release in China. Oppo calls Air Glass an assisted reality delivery device because it projects 2D monochrome info into your field of view instead of overlaying 3D. So it's kind of like Google Glass. Air Glass weighs 30 grams, has a Qualcomm Snapdragon 4100 processor, and three-hour active battery life with 40 hours of standby. The glasses can be used for notifications, directions, teleprompting, and real-time translation. You can control it with touch, voice, hand tracking, and head tracking, or through the app. It comes in full or half frames and can attach to conventional glasses. It's pretty. I'll give them that. It's a nice design. It's uh, AR light, but it's like, what, three and a half years after? 
Google Glass is like, yeah. More than that now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah you're right. It's more than And Google Glass is still yeah. around for enterprise. So maybe because they probably don't sell Google Glass in China, right? Uh, maybe this is a, a great opportunity for Oppo to sell uh, a similar thing in a niche enterprise system the way Google Glass is used now. I don't see this getting widespread consumer adoption, do you? I kind of wonder if Air Glass wants to be widespread co consumer adopted. The way that this reads to Maybe me is, not. yeah, I mean, sure, we can compare it to Google Glass. Google Glass didn't really work for the consumer market, also ahead of its time, right? But but still in use today, as our other AR glasses products, um, certainly in the enterprise, it kind of seems like Air Glass is going for the same market. It, it, it almost, yeah. Maybe that's what they're doing. Maybe we're just thinking that it's going to be a consumer because we're consumers. Yeah. Um, you know, consumer play because we're consumers. But uh, yeah, it doesn't look like they're marketing this towards us. I don't see myself walking into a Best Buy anytime soon and picking these up. I think what throws you off is the design too, right? If you're expecting an enterprise level niche device, you're like, oh, it's going to have a chunky, durable looking design. That's This is like a very slick, like, oh, that doesn't look too bad if I were to clip that onto my glasses. But hey, who says the enterprise can't have beautiful things? Exactly. Good job, Hoppo. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, Pride it's of almost, enterprise. It's almost CES-like uh, today. We got we got some product-oriented uh, stuff Lots sneaking of. out uh, ahead of CES in January. Dell announced more details on Concept Luna, its laptop with removable components. The aim of Concept Luna is to help Dell meet its goal of recycling or reusing a laptop for every laptop it sells. So Concept Luna makes parts easy to scavenge and use in future systems. Dell thinks a motherboard could be used in up to three machines. Uh, once a motherboard comes out of a higher level laptop, it could be used in a lower level laptop. You can remove four screws and then two bars they call keystones and disconnect a single cable to remove the motherboard. That's pretty simple. Not the simplest, but it's pretty simple. That motherboard could then go from, say, an XPS, which is their higher end, to a Latitude. An average user should be able to take the laptop apart and replace its components in an hour and a half. Uh, the keyboard is also removable, but likely not as reusable, maybe just one more time, because uh, keyboards suffer wear and tear a little more. But the idea here is that people could get recycled parts to repair their own laptops and possibly upgrade them and move older parts into the system for repairing other machines. So maybe you have a latitude you get a reused motherboard from an XPS, you put it in your Latitude, and then you take that motherboard out of your Latitude, you send it into Dell, maybe they use it in another model. Dell's still trying to figure out the details of how this would all work in practice and whether machines would need to be labeled as refurbished if they sell them reusing parts. They may not use this at all. This is, this is all part of a, a system to kind of see how it would work and show off a prototype. And yes, Framework fans, the Framework laptop is already doing this and is available, but the scale of Dell could have a larger impact. And the other efforts like Framework don't emphasize reuse and recycling as much as Dell is with Concept Luna. So when I when I look at this story, I, I think that particularly when it comes to laptops, they can they can stick around for a long time depending on what your use case is. So you know I, I've got a nine year old laptop. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. I use it probably two times a week and it does what it does. I can't upgrade it anymore though. I can't I can't put the newest operating system on it. So if I had the ability to replace the motherboard and processor or to do, to do you know just minor things to it that would give me some more life on that as compared to having to go and buy a brand new laptop to replace it. That would be of interest to me. I think, however, that in order for this to work, it can't just be Dell as big as Dell is. They're going to need to figure out how to get some other players to come along. Now, not necessarily their biggest competitors, but maybe some of the smaller players who say, OK, Dell, we'll follow your lead and do this stuff, too. I also wonder and, you know, I, I don't want to be too much of a pessimist because I think this idea is really great. What what's in it for Dell? Dell saying. Concept Luna, we're going to, you know, reduce, reuse, recycle. And and as a consumer, you benefit because you have the opportunity to upgrade a system or at least to be able to to give other folks parts of your system that you don't need anymore. But, okay, it's a company. So, yeah, like what it, – it, 
I, I understand saying, hey, as a company, this is important to us. This is going to make us look good. This is what we're going to do. I think that part is awesome. But it, as a company, you also want to sell merchandise. So anything that keeps you from selling merchandise because somebody can do a little, you know, smaller upgrade into their existing system doesn't totally make sense either well, if you're the company. Let's imagine this isn't this doesn't end up getting used for repairability. What if it is simply to make it easy for Dell to strip out parts and rebuild newer machines with the older parts? That, and this is the Depression era father I had talking, saves you money. Reusing things saves you money. If Dell is suddenly saying, hey, we've got this recycle program, trade in your old Dell for a new one, and then taking all those parts and very efficiently able to like strip out motherboards, strip out hard drives, strip out keyboards, and put them in other models, that reduces the amount of parts they have. In a world with chip shortages, that would be have been an extremely advantageous thing to have uh, just about now. Uh, yes, there's a cost associated with doing that, but uh, that potentially, they may have run the numbers and said, man, you know, just internally, this could do two things, save us a bunch of money on parts and provide us that PR boost of saying we are now reaching our goal of recycling or reusing a laptop for every laptop we sell, which is going to help, you know, lift your boat in the in the public consciousness of like, oh, maybe I should buy from Dell because they seem to be responsible. I will add that uh, currently Dell does a refurbishment program where they basically take a bunch of leased models back from companies and they refurbish them through a third party and they sell them back to the public. If you could do that with a lot of the consumer laptops and then this is what the third party companies do, they mix and match. So they won't give you the full 32 gigs of RAM that it originally shipped with, give you 16, they'll give you a smaller hard drive. They'll, they'll mix and match and they'll set it to a price point gives them a lot more flexibility down the road instead of just selling this one particular model at this particular feature set at this price. You can mix and match depending on what the market needs. And look, and look, and look at that and say like, oh, you know how hard it is to refurbish now and it's still worth it? What if we designed our laptops to make it really easy to do that in the future? I don't know. That's that's the best I can come up with, Sarah. As the Dell has to pay money to put this stuff into a into a landfill. Let's yeah, see right. If we can put that money into a, yeah, a, a, a box point. and sell it to somebody else, then their bottom line gets a little better. Well, Tom, you mentioned uh, it was a CES-esque show, um, and LG continued its tradition of mid-December pre-CES prototype announcements with two new TV concepts. One is a version of the 65-inch LG OLED EVE TV that has a screen cover that you can trigger with a remote control to turn it into an art object when you're not watching TV. Kind of put something else on the wall. It can roll down halfway, also show a clock. It's available now in Korea uh, for the equivalent of 8,381 US dollars. It is not cheap, but it is nice. More conceptual though is the LG Stand By Me, a wireless 27 inch TV, so a smaller television with a built-in three hour battery that can roll around on a movable stand. Yes, the TV would not have to be plugged into the wall, but three hours of battery. It's not autonomous. It's just movable. So you can height swivel the screen, rotate it right or left, rotate it between landscape and portrait. You have some options if that's the sort of thing that you're looking for. It also has a cradle on top for your phone, so you can use it for video calls with your phone's camera. And it supports USB as well as HDMI, so you could use it with a laptop also. It's also a touch screen, so if you don't want to use the remote, you can swipe to select. Uh, select apps and use other controls while in the interface. I wanted this to be autonomous. I wanted it to be a little robot TV that would follow me <laughs> around uh, while I'm doing my things, which would be really dumb and everyone would make fun of. Uh, but honestly, this isn't bad. I don't bad. think that would be dumb. I think that'd be <laughs> extremely helpful. The, the innovation here is the battery of saying we figured out how to get the power consumption low enough and the battery capacity high enough that we could stick a battery in this TV and then put it on a rollable stand. And now it's up to y'all when we show this up at CES to figure out what you'd use it for, right? No, I love this idea too. First of all, 27 inch TVs, 
I know that 27 inch TV is not the smallest screen in the world, but you know, it's, it's smaller than a lot of, you know, home televisions, you know, what you got in your, in your living room. So that's kind of small three hour battery life. I mean, if I'm on a binge, I need more than three hours, a lot more. I need seven, eight hours. Yeah, if you're so, on a binge though, you can plug it in, right? Yeah, but then the portability doesn't make a lot of the sense. The portability isn't for sitting and binging. That's so, that's what I'm saying. I, I want to give you guys a use case. To Trying to make it work for me. You're probably going to say, ah. So I have a buddy, real good friend of mine. He has a deck, a patio, and a gazebo. He's got two TVs mounted to tripods that we roll to wherever we are watching football and drinking sudsy beverages. <laughs> um, and it's a hassle because we're, we're dealing with extension cords and and cables and all that kind of stuff to, to get the TV to where we need it to be. Wi-Fi is throughout his entire yard, so that works. But if we could just have a TV that's you know, that, you know, we connect it up, uh, you know, to get the game on Wi-Fi and it's battery operated. And all you have to do is carry this thing out there. All you really need is three hours for, for a good game. Um, because so. at some point yeah. people are going to go eat, you plug it back in, you carry it back in, you know, things tend to move inside or move towards the fire pit, uh, you know, as the evening progresses. Three hours is more than enough, and that battery life will get better in time. I don't know if they're looking at this as a as a proof of concept to see if people are going to go for it, but I know I can think of at least a couple of buddies and myself that would be interested in a battery-powered TV that I can easily move around and not have to worry about power cords. I'm imagining that somebody has this – while they're binging, Sarah, you're sitting on your couch and then you're needing to prepare dinner. So you unplug it, roll it into the kitchen, start making your dinner. And then, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, then you start uh, f finishing your dinner. Now you want to move into a different room and you roll it in there. You can plug it in in there. Maybe maybe you got multiple places yeah, to plug it in. Yeah, but you don't always have to plug it in. Three hours gives you the right, and it's it's funny because you know it depends on the uh, layout of your house, right? My mom is currently um, she's kind of in the market for a new TV, and and because of the way that her living room and kitchen are, I'm like, oh, you just you know you know we need to mount the TV and be able to you know give it like a 90 degree angle, and you're good to go. But not everybody's house has that. Your kitchen might kind of be, you know, around the corner or I don't know, maybe there's a bedroom or something like that. I I think this is great. I do. I feel like if it's a 65-inch TV that can give me eight hours of battery life, I'm buying it. Oh, me too. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'd get that. <laughs> so we'll, when we send Rich Trofolino and Amos uh, to CES, we'll send them to the LG booth to make that request. Uh, Please do. You know, yeah. Appreciate that. Hey, folks, if you have a thought about something on the show but you don't know our email address... It's feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. TFT Central noticed that Xiaomi was selling a display that was listed as HDMI 2.1, but did not appear to have any of the new HDMI 2.1 features. This did not turn out to be a case of deception. This is allowed by the HDMI Standards Organization. TFT Central decided to investigate why is it that a monitor could say it's HDMI 2.1 compliant, but not support any of the features of HDMI 2.1. And if you don't know, HDMI 2.1 has been around for a couple of years now. It added support for several features, including higher bandwidth transmission, which allows you to do more things, like higher resolution, dynamic HDR, eARC, the ability to route audio back and forth through HDMI, variable refresh rate, auto latency, uh, auto low latency mode, ALLM, a uh, bunch of other things. Displays could support some of these before, but now they were part of the spec. You might be forgiven for assuming this meant that if you got a device that said it was HDMI 2.1, it would have all those features. That is not the case. When the HDMI Licensing Administration adopted HDMI 2.1, it decided to stop certifying devices as HDMI 2.0 in what appears to me to be a clever bit of bureaucratic and marketing reasoning, that means if you had a device that supports HDMI 2.0 features, but doesn't support any HDMI 2.1 features, you would have to have it certified as HDMI 2.1. Why? Because they don't certify HDMI 2.0 anymore. Why? Reasons, I guess. They really haven't made that clear. Uh, the HDMI Licensing Administration told TF Central that the features of HDMI 2.0 are now a subset 
of 2.1. All the new capabilities and features associated with HDMI 2.1 are optional. This includes FRL, the higher bandwidths, VRR, ALLM, and everything else. A spokesperson for the HDMI Licensing Administration, Douglas Wright, told The Verge, quote, we are all dependent on manufacturers and resellers correctly stating which features their devices support. That is part of the spec. If you label it HDMI 2.1, you have to make it clear which features of HDMI 2.1 you support. TF Central notes that many manufacturers are still labeling their displays as HDMI 2.0, even though HDMI Licensing Association says they could call them HDMI 2.1. That may be because they were certified HDMI 2.0 before it was withdrawn. But the upshot for us is that when we're looking at a device that says it's HDMI 2.1, we can't trust that. We can't use that as a shortcut. We need to do extra work to see Why what is that an features. Upshot? <laughs> the up I'm sorry? What's the what's the upshot? The upshot of, for of us is a consumer we, doing more work. I'm saying the summary. The summary, the upshot, the the effect, the thing that we can the what it means to us is when you see a device with HDMI 2.1, you can't trust it. Yeah. You need to do some extra work to see what features it actually supports. So, Tom, this makes perfect sense as long as you don't think about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so you're going to have a bunch of 2.1 certified devices that have no 2.1 feature set in it because of as you bureaucracy. Is, 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 that, is that what we think is happening here? That seems to be part of it. They were like, well, we need to get rid of HDMI 2. Well, what do we do about the devices that would otherwise be HDMI 2? Just make them HDMI 2.1. Well, what if they don't have any of the features of HDMI 2.1? Oh, uh, well, put a thing in there that says the manufacturers have to make it clear what features they support. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I know I know the audience uh, here is like, okay. Well, I, I do my research. I, I, I can figure that out. Uh, the 2.1 uh, nomenclature is, you know, sort of suggested. Uh, but I wonder how much this just um, serves to confuse everybody else. Oh, it's going to confuse even us, I think, because we're just used to trusting. Like, oh, if I see HDMI 1.8, 1.7, yeah, I know what that means. Now we all have to adjust and go, mm, 2.1, okay, well, I have to read farther. I can't right. use that as yeah. a shortcut, which, I mean, granted, USB is kind of like that. Just because it says USB 3.1 doesn't mean it always supports power. It's like 4G you know, LTE all over again. <laughs> it is. It's oh, wow, yeah. Um, it's it, it works, I, I, I guess. You, you just you, you can't really trust a 2.1. You have to look at the other specs to make sure that those are the things that you want. I mean, so... So why even have 2.1 on there? Well, it to let no you know sense. it's not 1.7. That's why. <laughs> Could be worse. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Rob, why don't you tell us about this, uh, this uh, advance in uh, medical imaging hacking? Absolutely. So scientists published an article in the journal Nurture, excuse me, Nature Communication showing that alerting medical scans can fool uh, oh, excuse me, altering mu medical scans can fool human radiologists and algorithms into believing evidence of cancer either was there when it wasn't or vice versa. The scientists designed a GAN model that automatically added or removed signs of cancer from the medical images. An algorithm designed to detect such evidence was fooled by the altered images 61 point excuse me, 69.1% of the time, and human radiologists were full between 29 and 71% of the time, depending on the individual. Similar research was presented in 2019 at the USINIX conference. This research indicates limitations of algorithmic assistance, but also highlights a potential risk from outside attackers who might try to access medical images and maliciously alter them. Potential reasons for these attacks might be to target a specific patient or to engage in insurance fraud. Algorithms should be trained on such models to improve the ability to detect the altered images and radiologists need to be aware of the possibility and trained to spot them. Oof. Oh that man. Was... Yeah. Uh, I mean, okay. Insurance fraud. <laughs> Let's just take that part of the equation, uh, you know, for a second and think about that. Insurance fraud happens in all sorts of ways. Uh, this is a new one for me. Never heard of this before, but I can absolutely see why it would be something that somebody would try in the fact that a human radiologist, with help from lots of technology, of course, would would need to feel really confident in, in what they're seeing. That's their job. 
Um, and you know that, it, and like in many cases, life-saving job. Uh, but uh, but yeah, it's a uh, it's a brave new world. This this is a good news story. Let's let's try not to lose sight of that. This is researchers figuring out. Okay, if someone were going to try to do some harm, uh, how could they do it? Let's figure that out so that we can make are algorithms that assist radiologists and the radiologists themselves smarter so they don't get fooled before someone tries to fool them. Uh, I, I think the risk here is kind of low, but when you're talking about medical stuff, you want to get that risk as close to zero as possible. So I'm glad they're doing this. I'm glad they're finding this stuff out before the bad folks do. Uh, and even if there isn't much risk of a lot of people being harmed by this, Man, it's 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 good to know that, that just to know, for once yeah. we're ahead of the game instead of like totally. we are with Log4j, well behind it. Yeah, Tom, I, I thought after, you know, when we went through this, you know, um, in, in the rundown, and I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, you know, why would an organization or why would a person want to try to fake this stuff? And ultimately, it, it comes down to, you know, we're, when we're talking about medical stuff, this is there's a lot of money involved. I mean, insurance is expensive. Mm -hmm. Insurance companies mm -hmm. have they, they don't want to pay out claims if they can if, if they can avoid it. And then there are going to be unscrupulous people or unscrupulous organizations that are going to be like, if we can actually make it look like something is there that is going to get this person paid more. Um, and we get a piece of that, then, you know, th there's a benefit. As you said, I believe that the instances of that happening are relatively small. But like you said, it's just good that they're getting in front of it in case anybody does try to do this, we're going to be better prepared for it. And I, I think there's also side benefits to research like this where they, you know, the unintended consequences are positive, which is the algorithms yeah, this get is, better. Yeah. Yeah. The algorithm's better at stopping this kind of uh, thing, but also it's now better at stopping these other things that we hadn't even contemplated before. So I think that's good too. All right, let's check out the mailbag, Sarah. Uh, let's do it. This one comes from Andrew, uh, proposing a solution to selling used clothes or any other used goods. We talked about this on the show yesterday. Andrew says, NFTs. Sellers just need to include NFTs to everything that we buy. Also, clothes companies could offer authentication programs for older clothes where they issue new NFTs. You know, Andrew's uh, half joking uh, when he sent this email, but he's not far off. There could not be... Idea. Maybe not exactly NFTs, but there could be some kind of blockchain way to handle this where we're using blockchain for supply chain tracking right now so that you mm -hmm. know those strawberries are organically grown in Portland, say, you know, there's there's stuff like that happens. Yeah. What if you could do this and say, yes, this is an actual Balenciaga hat. Uh, and and it, you, you've got the blockchain uh, to prove it. Maybe it's an NFT, maybe it's some other kind of token created specifically for this. But when, I, when I run through this, I'm like, Andrew may be onto something here. And then I run into, but it would have to be implemented by the makers of the clothing. And they have and no reason to do it. They're not no going to do it to help uh, third-party sellers sell they, used versions. They'd rather sell you a yeah. brand new coach bag then have you go buy a used yeah coach bag. so what we have to do is we have to convince them they're doing it for reasons of anti-counterfeiting then they'll totally do it and i mean i just, I just bought system. some yeah. expensive perfume online do i know if it's count i don't know i mean mm -hmm. i smells pretty good but like <laughs> but an nft that that showed where it came from and where it had been before it reached me that would be great I, it would I, actually I, it would actually get me to buy more expensive items more often. I'm actually warming back up to this idea of like you get the the brand, the clothing brands to say, look, you want to fight counterfeiting, use a blockchain for this. You know, use an efficient one, one that's like proof of proof of uh, stake, not proof of work. Use one with that. Don't use Ethereum. Use something with, you know, cheap gas fees, all of that stuff. You could do it and say it's all for anti counterfeiting. And then the third party sellers can use that. Just don't tell them that part, you know? If any of you are listening in the clothing industry, don't pass this along to your boss. Just saying. <laughs> yeah. I, I can see Andrew might be onto something here. I think you're onto something, Andrew. I know you're onto something. I do. I, I do, too. Um, if you if you feel like you're onto something, we ever talk about something you want to chime in on, please do let us know because your feedback is really important to us. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send those emails. We also have a brand new boss, and we would like to thank Matt Misner. Matt just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Matt. Yay. Applause. <laughs> you 
just, Matt got, you, just, Matt, see, you just have to bring the applause. You just ask for it, and it, well, and, yeah. and it comes. When Matt was alone, the only person to to, to be a, a new boss today, he got all of that applause for himself just a big auditorium for matt for matt uh thanks matt uh really happy to have you on board also thanks to rob dunwood for being with us today rob where can people keep up with your work i am at rob dunwood on all the things and you can always check me out on my other podcast the smr podcast and the tech john podcast Excellent. Well, we love your work, and we always love having you on the show. We're also live, everybody, Monday through Friday, did you know? 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 21.30 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we'll be back tomorrow. Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this broker. <laughs>